There we go. It's working. I believe it's working. All right, so welcome, welcome. Uh, all the usual caveats. Welcome to the big board. It's a live stream, anything can happen. We can have interruptions. We can lose connection, all that sort of fun stuff. So it's been a while since uh, we did uh, a little live stream. I thought I'd do something different tonight because I'm still setting up uh, Game Tone 2 of the next war. It's taken a little while longer than I had hoped. Uh, there were a significant number of units that need to be put on the board for the Soviets, number one and number two. Uh, I've yet to really do the air war setup for both sides, so it's uh, taken a little while. Uh, so tonight, what I'm going to do is review, and when I say review, I mean really talk about, in general, the uh, couple of games that I played today with a buddy of mine, and before I do that, I'm going to get my notes. I'll be right back. Yeah, it's not really, it's not really notes so much as it's, uh, you know, a, a little prompter. So I, I try not to forget all the really important stuff, right? Okay, so I see there's a few people who are online right now. So if you've recently just joined, we're going to get started in just a second. Uh, would like a little feedback in terms of sound quality, video shape, and stuff like that. So everything, if everything looks good. We'll keep going. If not, we can reboot this and restart. That's the great thing about doing these live casts. So if you have a second, say hi and let me know how the sound and the picture is and all that sort of, all sort, that sort of fun stuff. Uh, and of course, you can be shy and not say anything either. It's okay. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk about two games that I played today that uh, from approximately the same period of time, yes they are, uh, let me just double check here, yep, uh, medieval era, so 11th century, uh, this one battle, the Battle of Lincoln, I played in the House of Normandy, and it was 1141, so around, you know, roughly the same era, and pretty much the medieval uh, period is the medieval period, a bunch of pushing and shoving, some axes, some shields, some horse guys, a couple of generals running around in mail, and general mayhem. There's not a lot of, there was not a lot of finessing of combat per se. Uh, far as I know, caveat, right? So what I want to do is look at two games from a similar period that take very similar approaches, but end up with a very different gameplay result. Uh, and I think that would be instructive for us. And I have some criticisms of, you know, actually both the games, but uh, there's nothing horrible. Uh, it's more just uh, noticing differences, right? So the, the Klontov uh, game, you know, this is a, a printout of the rules from S&T 162. So it's a magazine game. And you know where I stand on magazine games, I think they should be good regardless. It doesn't, just because it's a magazine game and just because it's an S&T magazine, magazine game doesn't mean that it should be shitty and we should put up with crap, right? This is not crap. This is a light, fun, fast playing game. And it's designed to be a light, fun, fast playing game. Uh, but let's talk about systems and me mechanics. That's kind of what I'm, I'm interested in here. These, in terms of scale for both of these, game systems and the battles that I play, they're battle scale. So you're dealing with, excuse me, you're dealing with uh, formations, uh, you're dealing with groups of men of, you know, two, three, four hundred at a time, that type of thing. Pardon me, my pen down. I don't know what I have for dinner, but it's not agreeing with me. And uh, the, this, this, the situations, the historical situations are interesting and meaningful. In, in one, it's the, you know, different groups of bands of Irish and uh, 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 Danes uh, fighting each other and uh, Vikings fighting each other, and it's set in Ireland. And in the other, it's, uh, it's more about the House of Normandy, which uh, is an interesting era, in fact, because it kind of heralded in the end or the, the beginning of the end, perhaps, 
of the of the medieval age because they were very good stewards, uh, good politicians, and maybe good bureaucrats or good uh, administrators is the, is the point there. So interesting period of time. It's nice to sit down and play a battle that is from an era that you don't know too much about and look at that, <clears throat> compare and contrast to other eras you've played. You know, particularly, I look at everything through the lens of great battles of history or through the Men of Iron series and things like that. And so they're very, very different uh, different systems here. Now, the, the Clontarf game at the, at the get-go, Adrian McGrath says, it's going to be simple, want to get more people in the game, want to make it easy for you to play, uh, but don't want you to have to fuss with the rules a whole lot, and want you to have fun. So if that's the lens that we're going to look at this through, and a, a, look, a little bit of a look at history, I think the game probably achieves most of those uh, conditions. The, the victory conditions in this game, are the, the objectives of each player in this particular title are basically to bludgeon the crap out of each other. And whoever is, has a guy left on the board will probably win. Uh, it's a 24 turn game. I can't see any game going past 12 or 15 turns. It's, it's a bloody... Uh, uh, combat system. And when I, uh, today when we played, I played with my buddy Pete, we played the House of Normandy Battle of Lincoln first, and then we played this game. And it was readily apparent that the two systems were trying to achieve very similar things and had a very similar uh, uh, mode of movement, combat, combat resolution, the, the, the differences came in the details of how they brought out gameplay decision-making and what the roles you were making meant. Uh, so you have complete intelligence in the game. You know uh, exactly where everybody is. You know what everybody's doing. You can see the entire map. So you, have, you do have the God's Eye view in both these games. Uh, I think the, you know, the, we talked about the, the battle space really, it's uh, pretty much we're only focused on fighting this finite battle, in fact you start, both sides start very close to each other. Um, lots of detail in one game, actually no, you know what, uh, neither of them really had a lot of detail in terms of formations or leaders, you, you really had to read the designer notes and know that the counter A was leader A, uh, and and counter B was you know Bill, right? You, it didn't say Bill on the counter. There are two counters on the Clontarf map uh, game that say uh, this is you know an important dude who can't move or do anything, and this is another important dude that can't move or do anything, one for each side, and one of them was in Dublin, and the other one was up on the hill. Uh, so if you capture those guys, you get more VPs. Uh, otherwise, the VPs are for slaughtering the, the enemy. Uh, typical sort of kinetic action thing going on where uh, both sides rush at each other and bash the crap out of each other. And that's probably the point where the two systems begin to uh, diverge. Uh, the combat resolution in Klontarf is very one-sided. You attack, you inflict a result, or you don't inflict a result. There's no negative effect upon you for engaging in combat. So if you engage in combat and you don't kill something by rolling a high number, well, it's okay, nothing happens. Uh, you may be out of position for the next turn, but generally speaking, nothing negative is going to happen to you. So that tends to drive you to make what I would argue are stupid attacks. You attack a one to two. Hey, I might, I might roll a six. I might uh, put a, a step loss on that guy and that will be awesome. So I'm going to go do a one to two attack. If I can't get a one to one attack or a two to one attack or a three to one attack, the tables max out of four, um, then what the hell? I might as well just do this one to two attack. So as, uh, as we started this game, the first thing I did as the, uh, as the Irish player was I pulled back into the woods because all my guys were doubled and I wasn't going to attack. I was going to sit back and let him attack me. He rolls up and he starts to roll attack at a 1-2 to two and 1-1 one to one and he's getting these results and he's got these Viking archers that fire their arrows over his guys into my guys. 
no defensive benefit in the woods. I'm like, this is bullshit. So out I come and I just start attacking and I'm rolling at one to two and two to one and one to one and plus one for leader and minus one for his leader and it was chaos, right? Uh, <laughs> and so you're rolling a lot of dice here and you're just going, oh, wow, wow, maybe if I get a six, I'll be really lucky. And it struck me while I was playing that, you know, it, obviously that feels a little problematic, uh, but it also reminded me of GTS because in GTS, there's no disincentive for you to make a stupid attack uh, with a one in 10 shot with some ranged weapon because you, you, nothing bad can happen to you and you might get lucky. And that, that, there's something about that mechanic that really annoys me or pisses me off. Uh, so I, I really felt like, here, you stand still, I'm gonna punch you and see how long you stand up and then you punch me and see how long I stand up. And whoever falls over first, the other guy wins. And I understand that that is somewhat, in fact, probably very much like what the conflicts may have actually been like. Those guys uh, were uh, coming off the back end of the Vandals and the Huns and whatnot, and they were trying to rebuild their societies, and there was no finesse, there's no you know, Scipios or Hannibals or any of that sort of or any of that sort of fun stuff. So uh, it was uh, bludgeoning the other guy until uh, they bled. So I would say that Klontarf, if you want to sit down and, and crank out a game and explore a little, little bit of history, maybe try some different tactics and strategies, that's great. But there's no benefit to getting behind a guy. There's no benefit from getting on his flank. There's no, really not even any zones of control. You can move from zone to control to zone control, one, one X. Uh, so it, it, it was fun. I think it'll be more fun if I had to drink more. Uh, I didn't drink anything. I drank coffee and water. I just wasn't in the mood. Uh, but if you've got a drink to make a game interesting, I'm thinking we don't need that game anymore. So, uh, not my game. Played it. Happy to play it again. But not a game that I would run out and buy tomorrow. It really showed us that a very, very simple game can be a very simple game and not that interesting. So, which leads me to the House of Normandy, and when we played that game, uh, the first thing, uh, you know, if we looked at decision space and the intelligence you have and the kinetic energy and activity and all the rest of it, all of that is the same. <clears throat> What's different is you're given four command jets, and you need to two, choose two of those and work out how you're going to allocate them to the board. And that defines what can happen in a turn. So you can move retreat, attack, use a bonus chip, which improves move, attack, or retreat, or use a shield wall. But you can't use shield wall and move because they're on the flip sides of each other. So now you're making some hard choices. I really want to have those guys get into a shield wall so that as that cavalry attacks me, they get a bonus to their defense. Oh, but I've really got to move these guys over here on the other side because uh, I've got an opportunity to sweep the flank. Very cool. In a very simple way, I am given some hard choices to make about what I'm doing as a commander of multiple formations. Each formation is colored. Uh, each formation has a, uh, a color and a, rating and, a, and a couple of different ratings on them. The counters, uh, I think I've already shown you these guys before. Uh, with the, with Grun Grunewald uh, swords, it's the uh, shield and sword uh, system from Hollenspiel. <clears throat> uh, House of Normandy is the name of the game. But there's a there's a counter, and you can see how thick they are. They're big, thick wedges, right? And on the top left-hand side, it says L there. It's a levy, and this is actually a bowman or an archer and it has a C rating on it, and that's a bad example of a counter because it has a number on it, and most of the other guys don't have numbers. Uh, so I'm gonna grab a soldier out, or a, a veteran uh, lineman, or whatever the case may be, and he's a sword dude, and he has a V on him, and he has a, uh, a B rating. That's his full strength side. On the flip side, he is a C, 
yeah? Uh, and some guys go from A to C, some guys go from B to C. Uh, just depends on the, the, the battle and the type of units and things like that. <clears throat> and every unit moves the same amount, of same amount of spaces in the sequence of play. You move uh, three movement points, even horses. Even the horses move three movement points. Uh, the horses move three movement points because there's a, spe a special horse phase, and in that horse phase, they get to move another three movement points. So, uh, bringing that all together, they move six movement points, but in two different phases. Uh, when they first, uh, when they, when you do the, the horse phase, they can conduct a charge, and when they charge, they get some benefits, and, and bad things happen to people. Uh, the what happens here is we've got this very simple combat resolution table. I want to show you this because I want to show you, I talked to you a little bit before about what was happening in Klontov, how you could attack with no consequences, right? Well, here we have the ratings on the side. So it goes from double A, A, B, C, D, E, all the way down here on this side here. And, and you look at your rating and then you, well, first of all, you look up here and you compare the uh, unit types and then there's a DRM, it's a die, a die roll modifier, just like in Infidel or any other game. So uh, you know, big horses versus levies, bad. Uh, uh, veterans versus veterans, not so good for the guy who's attacking because he's attacking dudes who are veterans, so they're going to get uh, an actual benefit. If you're uh, veterans versus uh, levies, the levies are going to get their asses kicked. Pretty much levies get their asses kicked by everybody. And it's just a, but it's a die roll mod. And then there's terrain modifiers and if you've got more guys, you get a benefit and all that sort of fun stuff. <clears throat> Nevertheless, you get you look here, you roll a D8 and you take your, your DRMs from here, you go across and you see the results. And in, in these results, there's no effect, attacker retreat, defender retreat, attacker loses step, defender loses step, uh, attacker or uh, defender eliminated. So now there's a consequence for attacking or defending or not attacking or, or uh, choosing to withdraw or whatever the case may be. So immediately while we're playing that game, while the, the, the absolute mechanics of the game felt almost identical to something like Klontop, there's nuances and differences. I mean, there's locking zones of control and uh, there's actually morale in this game as well. Now there's no morale in Klontop, that's an optional rule. So you're fighting to the last unit. You can have two units left on the board and still could go at it, just knock yourselves out. It's kind of, you know, I don't think it's ever gonna get to that. At some point you're gonna be graceful like I was and say, hey, it's a bit of, a, it's almost a wash here. Let's call it you win just because I'm done rolling dice. Uh, had a lot of fun with it. it the, you know, the, the vagaries of the die rolls were pretty significant. You know, I rolled four sixes in a row at one point and then my opponent rolled four ones in a row and another. That just kind of sucks. <coughs> this game, nothing ventured, nothing gained, but there is a price if you don't, if you do attack and uh, you don't plan your attacks well. And I, and I liked that. I, and I liked the chip pull mechanic, not chip pull, uh, chip allocation mechanic to decide what your orders are going to be for each of the, uh, the given formations. So that, that uh, made me very interested. And the other thing that I like about it is that there's a, uh, there's an, I think they call it integrity perhaps or cohesion for each formation. So you sh I showed you some colored units before each, each formation is a different color. Uh, you, um, you must stay within a certain number of hexes of each other in the formation, otherwise you go poof and disappear. Uh, you basically, you break. So it's shown that your formation is too fragmented and you just leave the table. Uh, there are special rules for each individual scenario, which is a nice way to add that unique flavor for each individual game, uh, each individual battle, I should say. And so that really gave me a really good feel for what's going on in these Four battles, and I'll give you a couple of quick examples. That's not the uh, that's the rules. Uh, in the Battle of Lincoln, there's a dreadful and unendurable mass of Welsh rule, which basically means that as the losses for the Welsh accumulate, each time you lose a guy, you're rolling a die and adding the number of already dead to it. And once you get over a certain number, uh, then they all run away, which is very mean. There are royal defections in that battle. 
if you capture Stephen, the, the king or whatever, that's a bad thing, your automatic loss. Uh, in the Battle of Wilton in 1143, there's a rule regarding sunset. Uh, there's a re special retreat and pursuit rules and a rear guard rule. Uh, the standard, the Battle of the, Sta uh, the Standard uh, in 1138 has a special rule for just for the spearmen from the Scots, the Scots Red Wing. Uh, when they go into a shield wall, it does not fight at minus one uh, on the categories. It goes from A, B, C, I told you about. You don't go down a category. Uh, you do you, because they had spears. So lots of little, little things in this uh, game that really give it a, a nice flavor and, a, and more tactical choices and that's that's one of the things I think that helps make a game engaging is have it be uh, rich in rich in narrative full of decisions for yourself without being you know sort of bogging you down in a set of rules type decisions but making choices about the battle it makes it for a fun game uh, yeah, and this particular uh, this particular module has four battles in it, so I, I thought the price was was okay for for what you get for the big counters, thick counters, and beautiful artwork. So I wanted to share a little bit of that with you. Uh, I was hoping that I would win both my games. I didn't. We had a lot of fun playing. Uh, we sat around and shot the shit and had fun. So it's a good time. All right. Uh, no lamentations were generated, unfortunately. I was, I was the, I was the, uh, my women were lamenting and I was, I had been driven off the battlefield. All right, talk to you guys soon. That's all I had. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any questions or commentary going on. I'm not sure if I can, yeah, I'm not seeing anything there. So that assumes that you're just listening passively, which is fine. And I will talk to all of you later on. Take it easy.